Good afternoon, everybody. We're here. There is a chance that we may not be here, but we are here, and I'm happy uh, that we are all here. Uh, my name is James Walner. I'm a senior fellow with the Arch Street Institute, and this is the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. I'm really excited about the topic today, intra-party caucuses. And of course, we can discuss anything else you all want to, and you can throw lots of interesting questions and try to stump our, uh, our guest speaker here, whom I'll introduce in a minute. But it's a, it's a very timely topic. It's a great topic. And the, there's a lot of confusion around this topic. You either hate intra-party caucuses, or you love intra-party caucuses. And typically, that depends on the, the, the caucus in question. Um, and I think speaking to some of this ambiguity, it helps to remember that parties form in government, right? We're told this because they're helping to solve a coordination problem for their members, right? They're helping members achieve their goals. And so one way to think about intra-party caucuses is that they form in response to the failure of the broader party organization to help its members, or at least a subset of its members, achieve their goals. And with that mindset, we typically associate intra-party caucuses uh, with bad things for parties, right? And that certainly is a case. It does limit party power. They do limit party power in very important ways, and we can talk about that. I would suggest, though, that there's another way to think about it as well, which is they can help create avenues and structures in which to adjust and to try to influence the broader party organization, whether it be a strategy or its structure or its policy, whatever the case may be. And that they help solve their members' coordination problems and this ongoing <coughs> internal struggle within parties because parties themselves are not monolithic things. So in that sense, they're not a limit on majority party. They may actually, party power, they may help the majority party. And they may help the majority party adjust to a new environment and develop new mechanisms and new internal organizations to respond to the, uh, the conflict in its environment. And I, lastly, I'd say we're going to talk about the Freedom Caucus, although there's certainly intra-party caucuses in the, uh, the Senate as well. They're less salient there for a lot of other reasons we can discuss. But it really helps us understand, I think, the, the paradox at the core of the House today, which is on one <coughs> hand, you think of this uh, chamber, this institution, is, is driven by the majority party, where the majority rules and whatever they want happens. But as we've seen in recent years, not only this year, but also in past years under Democratic control, it's not always so easy. And one of the reasons why I like this topic so much is that intra-party caucuses reorient our attention to the individual member. And it reminds us that parties are simply collections of individual members. And if those members can't agree, the majority party's power is ultimately limited. So to help us through this today, we're going to have Matt Green here. He's a professor at uh, the Catholic University of America. I am proud to say he was my professor when I was in grad school. He is responsible for all of the absolute brilliant things that I've ever said, <laughs> and anything wrong that I've said is his fault as well. Um, nice. Okay. No. But he's, uh, he is an expert on the House, on Congress, on American politics, and pretty much everything else I've ever asked you about. I don't know if you've ever failed to deliver an um, answer to my questions. but. Um, he's also uh, written numerous books. Uh, he's written a book on the speaker uh, and the nature of the speakership. He's written a book on, uh, called Underdog Politics. He's got a, a forthcoming book on leadership. Leadership races. Leadership races. And then uh, also a project he's working on right now on uh, the Gingrich speakership, I believe. So with that, I would turn it over to uh, Matt Green from Catholic University. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you James. Um, since we have the mics here, I will stay seated. Can people, everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, thank you, James, for that very kind introduction. Uh, James is being far too humble. He was uh, an amazing student to have, and his insights were his insights, not mine. I just tried to guide as best as I could uh, uh, as, a, as a graduate student. Well, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I want to thank the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group for inviting me to be here today. And I also want to thank Congress for passing a funding bill so that this room is open and we can all be here today. Um, a little bit about myself before I begin my talk. I, uh, uh, many years ago, was a congressional aide, uh, worked on the House side in the 1990s, and then got very interested in Congress from a more scholarly, historical perspective, and went to graduate school 
and then was very fortunate to get a uh, teaching job at Catholic University, and so I was able to come back to Washington uh, and study Congress and teach classes on Congress. Um, so that's, uh, that's my story. Now, uh, I was invited to come here today to talk to you about the House Freedom Caucus. This is a um, sort of work in progress, something I've been researching for the last six months or a year or so, and it's based on a paper that I've been developing about the Freedom Caucus. <clears throat> I think it is uh, relevant to talk about the Freedom Caucus at a legislative branch capacity working group because for many people, the Freedom Caucus is responsible for the House failing to pass legislation, for slowing down, um, for being obstructionist, etc. And to be sure, there's a lot of passion on both sides of the partisan divide about the House Freedom Caucus as well as within the partisan divide. So you have folks uh, like Karl Rove and Ted Poe, a former Freedom Caucus member, saying fairly critical things that they don't uh, want to legislate, they just they sacrifice, uh, they prefer uh, ideal outcomes over actually getting things done. But then you do have folks on the other side of the partisan divide, or other side of divide, I should say, it's not partisan, um, but other side of the divide saying they're principled, it's good that they're there, they're trying to meet the promises of their constituents. I'm not uh, here to adjudicate between those two sides. Uh, what I'm trying to do in this project and what I'll talk about in, in my talk today is a more um, sort of academic, dispassionate view of the Freedom Caucus, trying to understand more about what its contributions have been to Congress, particularly the 114th Congress, the previous Congress, and from that, trying to glean some more general lessons about what intraparty organizations can do and the circumstances under which they are more or less influential. So first, just a few things about the House Freedom Caucus. Uh, Ruth Block Rubin at the University of Chicago recently wrote a book about what she calls intra-party organizations. These are groups of members of Congress from one party. Uh, they form an organization, so they have a set of rules, guidelines for membership, etc. And they usually form because it's, their members are unhappy. They want some sort of policy outcome, but uh, their leaders, uh, or committee chairs or what have you are preventing those outcomes from occurring. And so the purpose of the group is to uh, enact desired policy outcomes. With that definition, the House Freedom Caucus is a typical intraparty organization. And so in that respect, they're similar to ones that we've had in the past, like the Democratic Study Group, um, the insurgents, Republican insurgents of the early 20th century, the Southerners of the 1950s and 60s, et cetera. But there are some features of the House Freedom Caucus that are unusual, historically speaking, when we compare them with other intraparty organizations. So uh, for one, and this was, a, this was a point that James made when he was reviewing an earlier draft of this uh, paper, they focus somewhat more on negotiation and the use of procedure over policy development. They do develop policy, their members do write legislation. But that is not as central a function for them as, say, other groups like the Republican uh, Study Committee, for instance. Another important difference is that they are a binding caucus. So if 80% if of the members agree on a particular vote or outcome, all members of the caucus are supposed to vote for that outcome, uh, which makes them somewhat unusual, historically speaking, in Congress. A third difference, and this is one that I'm going to be focusing on more in my talk, is that their members seem to be more willing to vote against party leaders on bills and procedural motions, and more generally, uh, violate norms of party loyalty and party discipline in the House of Representatives. And that's something that is unusual, I would say, and also points to some interesting puzzle about the Freedom Caucus. So I think there's a lot of things that, that we could talk about with the Freedom Caucus, and during the question and answer period, I'm happy to talk about other aspects of the caucus. Um, there, you know, one puzzle, for instance, that uh, motivated my research is trying to understand why a group of members from the far wing of their party would vote against what their party's um, legislation or party leader's legislation is, even if it means that by doing so, the legislation fails and they end up with nothing that's more conservative than the status quo or even getting something that Democrats want or both. Um, another puzzle is, uh, is the Freedom Caucus or has it been influential? A lot of people claim, yes, it's very powerful and it's influenced legislation and made things difficult for Republican leaders, et cetera, but there hasn't been a lot of empirical study to see is there evidence to support that claim. 
So in my comments today, I'm going to focus more on the second question, but I'm also happy to talk about the, the puzzle of the first question. Okay. So the first thing that I look at in the paper is trying to understand why, in theory, the House Freedom Caucus would have influence. And again, I'm focusing on the 114th Congress. So this was the, the previous Congress, the first Congress in which the Freedom Caucus uh, formed and was active. And I think there are, three, there are three general contextual variables and other factors that would point to the Freedom Caucus being potentially influential. One of them is that they uh, were large enough and uh, unified enough to be able to, in theory, vote with Democrats to kill bills or uh, procedural motions, rules, what have you. Um, and, uh, What's interesting about this is that uh, what I argue is that it, the binding aspect of the Freedom Caucus is, I think, somewhat overstated. The Freedom Caucus, uh, to the extent that it would do something like that, vote with Democrats against Republicans, was not because they were bound to do so, but their members were predisposed to do so. And I'll show some data on that in a minute. In addition, um, the reason that they were pivotal, that they were able to switch uh, outcomes of votes if they wanted, was as much because of the narrow margin between the two parties and the fact that the Democratic Party, the minority party, was very unified during the 114th Congress. So Republicans couldn't count on getting Democrats to defect very often to make up for Freedom Caucus members choosing to vote with Democrats against uh, Republican leadership. Now to get at this, to show that this was the case for the 114th Congress in general, I looked at a few bits of, a uh, few sets of data. One was to look at all the roll call votes in the 114th Congress and to see the extent to which being a member of the House Freedom Caucus helps explain your vote choice. And I did that with regression analysis. So I, I ran a regression analysis for every roll call vote and for every member to see whether or not being in the Freedom Caucus helped explain your vote choice. And I did that while also controlling for other variables that scholars have said can influence vote choice, like region, um, or ideology, or if you're in leadership, et cetera. So I want to see the percent of votes in which we might say, yeah, the Freedom Caucus is determining uh, the voting behavior of its members. I also looked at the percent of roll call votes for which the House Freedom Caucus voted unanimously. So they're voting as a block. And I looked at the percent of roll call votes for which House Freedom Caucus members were pivotal, meaning if they had switched their votes, in theory, to the other side, the vote outcome would have reversed. Now, the problem with doing this kind of analysis is you don't know whether or not, say, if a bunch of people in the Freedom Caucus are voting together, is it because they're in the Freedom Caucus? Or were they predisposed to do that and they just happened to be in the Freedom Caucus? So the way I, I answered this question is I looked at the 34 Freedom Caucus members who were in the previous Congress, they served in the 113th, and looked at the same set of data to see if by not being in the Freedom Caucus, would these members still behave the same way? Uh, and uh, so I compared the 114th to the 113th. So what I'm going to show you is the results of that analysis. So the first set, so first of all, in this chart, the blue bars are the data for the 113th, and the red bars are for the 114th when the House Freedom Caucus existed. Uh, the first set of bars are the percent of roll calls for which being in the Freedom Caucus was statistically significant. What's interesting here is actually a lower percentage of roll call votes can be explained by being in the Freedom Caucus when the Freedom Caucus actually exists than when it doesn't. Now the difference is not statistically significant, so in theory it could be the same. But this suggests that it's not the Freedom Caucus that's, that's influencing members' voting behavior. Second set of data, you see almost identical percentages of roll call votes for which members of Congress voted in the Freedom Caucus or are going to be in the Freedom Caucus voted unanimously. So here, it doesn't look like the Freedom Caucus is making members vote unanimously. They're predisposed to do that anyway. The third set of data, I think, is the more interesting one. Here we see a much larger percentage of roll call votes for which being in the Freedom Caucus, may, or being a Freedom Caucus member or a potential Freedom Caucus member, meant you were pivotal. So a larger percentage of votes in the 114th were ones in which Freedom Caucus members could have changed the outcome if they had so chosen. Uh, and this again is a function of the Democrats actually being, in part because the difference between the two parties is smaller, but also because the Democrats are more unified. Uh, they're actually more unified overall in the 114th than Republicans are which is unusual, because usually a, the majority party is more unified 
than the minority party, or has been since the mid-1980s. So that's one precondition. The Faust Freedom Caucus is potentially pivotal. But there's two other factors here as well that I think matter in understanding why the Freedom Caucus might have been influential. The second is this propensity to defy party leaders and the norms of party loyalty. And uh, I tried to get at where that, how we could measure that propensity without looking at what the members did once they were in the Freedom Caucus. One example is the fact that 15 Freedom Caucus members voted against John Boehner for Speaker of the House in early 2015. That's before, I saw it, if my memory serves, before the Freedom Caucus was even formed. So voting against your nominee for Speaker traditionally is a big no-no. You're not supposed to do that. But these members did not care about these norms of being loyal to your party's nominee for Speaker. In addition, eight of the nine founding members of the Freedom Caucus uh, have very high what's called second dimension nominate scores. So nominate is a measure that many of us use to roughly estimate ideology. And first dimension nominate is tr the traditional left-right scale. The second dimension nominate is orthogonal to that. And it's sometimes unclear how to interpret that. Sometimes it's a region, for instance. But some scholars have suggested it measures a willingness to defy party leaders, uh, to be rebellious or a maverick, if you will. And I think it's telling that almost all the founding members have very high scores in this dimension. And then, as to why they might be able to do this, uh, uh, 538, I believe, uh, looked at electoral data for members of the Freedom Caucus and found that they were in safer districts on average than your typical House Republican. I don't think that's the whole story, but I think it helps explain why members of, this, of the caucus might not feel a strong disincentive to be rebellious or defy party leaders. There are also things that gave them incentives, which we can talk about later. All right, and the final thing that I want to, um, that, I, that I argue matters is that although the Freedom Caucus got a lot of criticism from other Republicans in the House and from Republicans outside the House and conservatives, um, they did not make a point of trying to defy everybody. They were open to working with leaders, party leaders, committee chairs, at least to a degree. And also, they had developed a pretty strong conservative brand name. And so by doing that, uh, they were potentially attractive to other lawmakers or other leaders who wanted to say, look, I'm with the Freedom Caucus, or I have an alliance with the Freedom Caucus. So that gave them the potential to form alliances with other members in their party in the House, which could be very important in terms of leverage or getting things through at the committee stage, for instance. So those are three preconditions that I think help explain why the Freedom Caucus could have been influential. Now, the question is, how were they, were they actually influential, and if so, why? Now, if you look at all roll call votes in the 114th Congress, and look at how many of them were ones in which the Freedom Caucus changed the outcome, there are very few. There are, by my count, exactly two, which would suggest Freedom Caucus didn't make much of a difference. Votes turned out the way they did, regardless of what the Freedom Caucus chose to do or not to do. The problem, of course, with that, among other things, is if you look at all roll call votes, you're including things like uh, routine bills, uh, bills that everybody likes. You're not looking at efforts by the Freedom Caucus to actually influence outcomes. So rather than looking at the aggregate data, what I did is a sweep of media reports of the Freedom Caucus uh, from major news sources to see how many times was the Freedom Caucus mentioned as trying to influence legislative outcomes? And then, to what extent were they successful in those outcomes? So based on my sweep, I identified 19 cases in which the Freedom Caucus tried to influence legislative outcomes. And of those 19, I coded 11 as ones in which the Freedom Caucus was either partially or fully successful in achieving its desired goals, which isn't a bad uh, success rate, almost 60%. Let me show you what those are. I'm not going to go through them all uh, in detail and then talk about what they have in common and why they, these instances might have been uh, successful. So here are the 19. Uh, and again, it's a lot of detail here I put on this chart. Uh, the point is, first of all, that the Freedom Caucus was exercising influence or trying to uh, with some success on budget matters, on immigration issues, on issues involving foreign policy, on who should be the head of the IRS. So it's a fairly broad range of items. In addition, the Freedom Caucus is not binding on all of these. So if you look at the column that says off pose, which is short for official position, uh, in many cases the caucus did not take a formal official position 
but its leaders and members still were trying to get a certain outcome. They didn't feel the need to bind their members necessarily. Now what do these have in common? Well, I argue you can put them into one of three categories. The first and most uh, frequent category are cases in which the Freedom Caucus either did or credibly threatened to form a cross-party coalition on the floor that would outnumber the Republican majority. Uh, and that potential, not necessarily actual, but potential was uh, often sufficient for leaders to either pull bills or pull rules or change rules or change bills. If they did not have the ability to or credibly threaten to do such a thing, they still could be successful if they had well-placed allies either in leadership or in the Republican Study Committee or in the party as a whole or uh, in committees uh, or in one case in the White House. And so these are cases where the Freedom Caucus found other ways to try to achieve their uh, goals without worrying about what would happen on the floor necessarily. And then the third, which is one case, although I throw Boehner in there, because I do want to talk a little bit about Boehner, uh, time permitting, is the impeachment of the IRS commissioner, which the Freedom Caucus did not successfully do, but they forced the House to consider it on the floor. And that's an instance in which the Freedom Caucus is using procedures that don't require the assent of leaders or a majority of the House to force onto the agenda. Um, and so this is an example of the Freedom Caucus, I would say, being willing to necessarily violate but bend the sort of norms of party loyalty. Is that if the leadership doesn't want something on the floor, you should not be trying to get it on the floor using uh, alternative means. These are cases in which freedom, the Freedom Caucus was not successful. In the majority of these cases, uh, they could not count on cross-party majority floor support and they did not have allies placed in important uh, places in committee or leadership, what have you. Um, the, there are three exceptions. There are two in which uh, they could actually get some support from key leaders, but they didn't have a majority on the floor. Um, in these cases, for example, in the First Amendment Defense Act, they didn't have the allies in the right places. They didn't have the Committee of Jurisdiction willing to consider and approve this bill. For Planned Parenthood, which is a complex story, a big part of that is that the Republican Study Committee said they also wanted to end funding for Planned Parenthood, but did not agree with the Freedom Caucus in their tactics. So it's not quite the level of agreement that might have helped them on the floor. And then the third category, Financial Services Bill, the Freedom Caucus basically um, changed their tactics and decided not to press this issue with Speaker Ryan. This was in mid to late 2016. So they just basically decided we're not going to fight this on the floor, though we think we might win. Uh, I want to talk, how much time do I have? Am I doing okay? Okay. I want to talk a little bit about John Boehner because uh, it seems no story about the Freedom Caucus is complete without talking about John Boehner. So as, uh, as I assume most people know, John Boehner stepped down unexpectedly in the fall of 2015 and the conventional wisdom is that he did so because the Freedom Caucus threatened a motion to vacate the chair uh, to bring that motion to the floor. Boehner thought he would lose so he stepped down. What I argue in the paper is that the story is a little more complicated than that. No, uh, not least of which because it, there seems to be evidence that there wasn't a majority in the House that was going to vote to vacate the chair. Democrats, at least Pelosi, had told Boehner, we're not going to vote for it. We're not going to help out the Freedom Caucus here. What I think is key, though, for the Freedom Caucus is not that they were going to actually remove Boehner, but that the, they were able to credibly threaten to force a vote to remove him. And that vote itself was seen by Boehner as dangerous to the rank and file because a lot of grassroots activists did not like Boehner. He was getting a lot of criticism and he didn't want to force his members to, uh, to positively assent to keep him as speaker. And you couple that with the fact that Boehner, by multiple accounts, didn't really want to be speaker anymore. So what's the point of forcing your members to cast a, you know, we want to keep you and then you quit anyway. So uh, it's not that the Freedom Caucus didn't contribute to his retirement, but it's not that they necessarily could bring a majority of the House to remove him. So uh, to conclude, and then I'm going to just talk, I have one more slide, talk a little bit about the current Congress. Um, the Freedom Caucus, I would argue, if you look in a case-by-case -case basis, was fairly influential. And the three key factors here that would explain its influence is number one, if it could credibly threaten a majority on the floor to support its position, even if that meant voting with Democrats. Number two, if they couldn't do that, if they had well-placed allies in committees or in leadership, 
And then number three, their willingness to use non-majoritarian procedures, or at least non-majoritarian, not needing a majority to bring a procedure to the floor to force members to vote on a particular measure. Um, I do think, and we can talk more about this, although it's not part of the paper, the Freedom Caucus has taken perhaps a somewhat different tack in the current 115th Congress, although I think it's still too soon to tell. Possibly more open to negotiation, possibly uh, less willing to openly reject rules and procedures. I think there's a number of possible explanations for this, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, one, I think is the big one, is unified party government. Uh, Mark Meadows himself said this early in 2015, we have a rare opportunity to actually get bills enacted into law. So rather than voting for things that are more conservative but will die anyway in the Senate or be vetoed, uh, we should actually be working to get things enacted. And so that changes the incentive structure for the Freedom Caucus in terms of its use of tactics and strategy. It also means there's more pressure on them from others to help the president to get to cooperate. In addition, uh, the Freedom Caucus now has an established reputation that they can and will reject bills, rules, etc. Uh, whereas in early 2015, they didn't have that. So they don't have as much of an incentive to show that they will reject things because they've already established that they are willing to do so. They also have ties to the White House, um, both with former Freedom Caucus members who are in the White House and with President Trump himself. And so that changes the dynamic in terms of the Freedom Caucus's preferences and their relationship with, uh, with the president. There's also a different chair, which may be a factor, and a different speaker. Ryan was still speaker, uh, was speaker for part of the 114th, but he's still relatively new. He also has a different governing style in relationship with the Freedom Caucus, more of uh, what Tip O'Neill followed, a, a, what's called a politics of inclusion. And so that may be um, curtailing some of the Freedom Caucus's initial willingness to resist and oppose the leadership. It's not the Boehner speakership, it's now the Ryan speakership. So I will stop there um, and um, turn the floor over to James. Or, oh. um, real quick, I want to ask, uh, can you hear me? Um, I just thank you for that. I think it was a great, um, great presentation. And, one of the reasons that I really like this, or lots of reasons why I really like this paper, but um, you know, is a is a former Senate staffer who admittedly worked for an interparty caucus, who is advising members or is someone on the outside who's trying to understand where decisions, how decisions happen, right? How policies are made. I always say locate the place where the decisions are made, right? And then try to identify the leverage you have to either influence the decision that's made in that environment, that location, or to shift it to a location where you ultimately can have more leverage, right? And one of the things I think that intraparty caucuses do is that they help do that for their members. But they also get to, I think one of the most important things, and, and it's kind of implicit in the analysis, is that they help create a social environment that is more conducive to challenging authority, right? Because that's really, I think, leaders, that's their power. And you don't really get this on the outside necessarily, but it's such a social environment. Um, and the intraparty caucuses help their members, whether it be a, a liberal Democrat in the 50s with the Democratic Study Group or conservative Republican in the 70s with the RSC or even today with the Freedom Caucus and the RSC. And the reason why, and I just want to kind of frame this and then we'll open it up for questions. The reason why I think this is important is because the stakes are high. And the reason why stakes are high is because driving change in organizations is hard. I don't care if it's your family, or your church, or your business, or your school, or anything else. And it's doubly hard when you get to this level in Congress and you start dealing with the issues that they're dealing with today. So it's a really important thing. And I think that the, the Freedom Caucus, when you think of it in that way, you can begin to see how it may be a, a, an advantage to the leadership in addition to the, um, in addition to the normal kind of limitation and weakness that, that most people see it as adversarial relationship, right? Because the thing about Congress is that it will change eventually. If the environment and the internal organization are perpetually disconnected, the latter will eventually align with the former because we have an electoral system. And so at some point that's gonna happen. And the question is, do the, does the Freedom Caucus and other interparty caucuses, and I'm gonna ask you this, Matt, is it a way to help <coughs> facilitate that, right? Is, do, are they, can you imagine a, a scenario in which the Freedom Caucus can help the leadership 
govern in this challenging environment? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> no. <clears throat> to elaborate. Oh, well, I, I think that's absolutely uh, a possibility. And I, I would love to be a fly on the wall for these conversations that happen between Ryan and members of the Freedom Caucus, because that's where those kinds of things would be happening. And maybe they are. I don't know. Um, one of the interesting things that the Freedom Caucus was um, talking about briefly after Boehner said he was going to retire was uh, possible structural reforms to the legislature, to the House. Um, and uh, um, that, to my knowledge, didn't really go anywhere, but it was this in sort of almost kind of DSG-like interesting opportunity for the, for the Freedom Caucus to say, we have a bigger you know, agenda here, which is kind of open things up and get members to be more involved. So I don't see any reason why the Freedom Caucus, like other uh, inter-party organizations, couldn't play that role. Um, <clears throat> I'm at, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Richard Skinner. I teach at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my question is about the allies. Who are they, and to what extent can we know if they're motivated by tactical reasons? They feel the need to buy off the House Freedom Caucus. They might need their votes on something else down the line, or maybe it's personal advancement in some way. And to what extent are they sincere motivations? They actually see the world uh, as the House Freedom Caucus does. Uh, that's a good question. I think it depends on the circumstance. So. In the case of the Republican Study Committee in the previous Congress, um, I can't speak to the motivation of the, of the chair of the caucus or uh, its members, but there were um, some interesting, sometimes interesting dynamics where the Freedom Caucus would come out on a position and then the Republican Study Committee would come out very shortly thereafter, um, as opposed to doing it jointly, which um, sometimes, which, you know, suggested maybe there was a kind of, oh, we need to, you know, this is the conservative, the conservative group in the House, and so we, we were going to get there anyway, but we better do it now so that we're allied with them. Um, but that's just, you know, in supposition, I don't know. Um, in other cases, though, I think it is genuine. So, for example, the Export-Import Bank, uh, the chairman of, I believe, the Financial Services Committee, had long been opposed to the Export-Import Bank. Uh, and then he had a press conference with Freedom Caucus members saying, we're not going to renew the charter. Um, but there's, I, I have no doubt that he, he, it was genuine for him and that the Freedom Caucus, uh, they had just had shared preferences as opposed to some kind of strategic, um, almost kind of cynical uh, alliance. So um, this is part of a bigger dilemma that party leaders have in Congress, House and Senate, uh, which is the use of the carrot versus the stick. And although um, you know, there's a lot of talk about party leaders need to be more like Lyndon Johnson and punish and direct and tell people what to do, that never works very well. Uh, so Ryan does have some tools at his disposal, just as John Boehner did. I mean, he could kick people off of committees. Um, he could deny them travel funds, things like that. But Boehner did all that, and all it did was just make the Freedom Caucus more unified, uh, and in fact starts saying maybe we need to get rid of this speaker. So um, I think that Ryan, as with most speakers, has to rely on informal techniques that are more carrot than stick. Um, offering inducements, um, <clears throat> you know, if you vote with, with the party, I can do this for you, I can do that for you. And then sort of soft tools like persuasion, I think are very important and I think they're underemphasized in a lot of the political science literature, frankly, about Congress, that it means something if the speaker calls you and says, I'd like to talk to you about this and, you come, and you, I'll come to your office, right, we'll sit down, this is really important to me, it's important to the party, really need your help. Um, and I think that um, either Boehner was not as good at that or he didn't try. And I, I don't know the answer. But I think that Ryan, from what I can tell, is more focused on the persuasion and the soft tools. So uh, that doesn't necessarily answer your question because that, that may not be enough, right? There may be times where Ryan says, look, we just can't, we can't do this. Um, I have to give Ryan credit for his ability to have gotten, avoided some of the sort of shoals that 
I think Boehner would have hit in the past and some very difficult votes that he was able to persuade the Freedom Caucus, you know, please come with the party. Um, and uh, I don't know, again, is that because the Freedom Caucus is more open to persuasion? Is it because Ryan's better at persuasion? I don't know. But it is a kind of case-by-case -case basis. I think the speaker ultimately has to rely on those sorts of tools when there's conflicts as opposed to the kind of punishment command approach. Yeah, no, the, I'm, I'm glad you uh, raised those, as those are additional ways in which Freedom Caucus members are electorally um, <clears throat> shielded from a kind of traditional inducements or punishments from leaders. Uh, I would also note they have their own political action committee, the House Freedom Pack. Uh, I don't know, or Freedom Fund Pack, I don't know how much of that, um, you know, how much money they really get that it makes a difference, but undoubtedly, I, I imagine it was created in part because they were not giving to the Republican Party, and you know Boehner had his you know quasi own you know, outside group that was running negative ads against them. So they've de they had, there is a kind of organizational shield if you're sort of a development a foundation for them. Having said that, though, I do think that it's it's a little more complicated as we've seen in the 115th Congress. And so so for instance, we've had Freedom Caucus members get sharply criticized by President Trump by outside conservative groups for saying you gave up, you're working too closely with the speaker. Um, so it's, there, it's a bit of a balancing act, and it's not clear that if Ryan were to talk to these conservative groups, get, make the Freedom Caucus do what you want them to do, I'm not sure that would work. I don't know if the, the, the lines of influence are that direction. Um, so I think given the complex political environment that speakers are in now is not 100 years ago where you have things like what you mentioned the political action committee uh, or these outside interest groups plus the media breitbart all this stuff there there really aren't a lot of options that speakers have it is worth thinking about or remembering there is one case where a freedom caucus member was defeated and freedom caucus members felt that ryan was responsible and that was the primary defeat of tim hull's camp um, and hull's camp had said, I, I want to be back on the Ag Committee, got kicked off by Boehner. And, and Ryan said, well, we'll revisit that later. We'll, we'll tell him, what are you talking I need to be on this committee. And he loses his primary, and the Freedom Caucus was furious, absolutely furious at Ryan. There were some reports that they might even try to run against him as speaker, um, but they didn't. So um, I don't know what that tells us, except that there are tools that Ryan can use uh, that maybe on occasion he is willing to use that could overcome the advantages that Freedom Caucus members have electorally. 
that's um, you know that's a good question. At one of the things that I'd like to explore more is that I would call it lost opportunity in 2015 uh, to really push for procedural change. And I don't know what that story is. I don't know if it was that they lost their appetite, if they weren't serious, if it got shut down. Um, but it is true that you know when you're in divided government with one kind of speaker, you can make one set of arguments, and then when you have a different, uh, say, unified government with a different speaker maybe you find those arguments a little less convenient. So under Boehner, divided government, they were talking a lot about how the process was closed, there was no opportunity for amendments, this is a really bad thing. Well, now we've seen uh, under the Ryan speakership on the 115th, we have all these closed rules. We have very few opportunities to amend on the floor. And we're not hearing the Freedom Caucus complaining about that. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's, as you say, because they say, well, we're getting what we want, we're happy. Um, maybe they're upset, but feel like, well, we have to prioritize. I don't know, but I do think the story of institutional change or lack thereof that the Freedom Caucus could have brought about is something worth exploring in more detail. Well, I thought I saw a hand over here. Anybody? Yeah. Um, I had a question. I'm Kevin Walshine, uh, former congressional staffer. Um, what kind of substance does the Freedom Caucus have? Is it, is it simply its members? Or does it have its own staff or any source of support other than the PAC that you mentioned? Yeah, so my understanding is they do have staff. They have at least one staffer, right, James? I think they have at least one staffer. Um, they, they have a budget, I believe, that they, they have dues that they contribute to. And then they have a you know regular meeting process. I think they have bylaws, which I have not yet seen. I'd love to get a hand on, uh, my hand on. But they have bylaws. <coughs> Uh, they meet on a regular basis. So um, they not only act as a regular organized group, but they do have these additional resources. They're not huge. You know, it's not like they have 10 offices and 100 staff, but they do have some support uh, that can help them achieve their collective goals. Yeah. Do you think that makes a difference in the caucus? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, and, and Ruth Block Rubin writes about this. I mean, that's, that's one of the key sources of influence for an inter-party organization um, is that, uh, and, and um, uh, other folks have written about this too, that the, having that as a resource allows them to do more research, to do some whipping. I mean, they do actual whipping sometimes. Um, so that, that kind of thing, just as with other inter-party organizations, is a big source of potential power for them. Yeah, I think it's a great question and a great point. I would, and I would just caution drawing parallels between intra-party organizations and their level of staff and the resources they may have. One, they may be at different places in their development, so one that's more fully developed may have more staff. But I think beyond that, it matters um, for what purpose they were organized. And so if you take like a Republican study committee, this is where the system, the party organization at the time, it really failed conservatives from their perspective in terms of policy development. So it was really organized around being an in-house think tank, right? Policy development was its goal. That's a very staff-heavy operation. Mm -hmm. The Freedom Caucus, at least from observing it from the outside, appears that it was formed to help their members exert leverage at certain um, points in the process, like rule votes, to help drive and force their leaders to negotiate with them. And so that's more of an operational focus in which you don't need as much staff, basically. Um, so there was an article in Politico magazine back in the day, right after the House passed the uh, health care vote, which of course many people thought it was not going to be capable of doing turn into a law, but that was still a real victory for the Republicans in the House. So the article was by Michael Nito. across the table from each other and not pretend that they agreed on everything hmm. and say, all right, we're in the same party, we really want to pass something, but we, we don't agree on what it should look like. Let's negotiate with each other and iron out a deal and both take out the look from each other within the same party. Um, and so they were sort of uh, arguing that intra intra-party blocks were going to sort of allow this kind of more negotiation to happen that had too often been sort of swept under the table 
just wondering, wondering what, you, what you make of that argument uh, when you see that at all. Uh, on, on other examples, when you have seen the path So. So right, so the the passage of the the health care bill in the House after first failing is a is a, a good example of the Freedom Caucus defying the conventional wisdom that they only want to vote no and don't ever want to reach an agreement because uh, they clearly did that, and it certainly suggested a, a promising model where groups could get together, almost a kind of Robert Dahl pluralist thing where these groups all kind of negotiate and then they come up with something. Um, the pro the problem is what happened afterwards, as I recall, which is the members of the Wednesday group, or Tuesday group, were very upset that their leadership had reached this deal uh, and caused a lot of turmoil within it. So part of the problem with that model is you've got to have groups whose members trust their leaders and that the leaders at the same time reach some goal that they know the members will be okay with. Um, and maybe that's something to explore further about the Freedom Caucus. There seems to be some uh, degree of deference to, uh, to Meadows in this case. They say, you know, we trust you, we're going to reach an agreement, um, and, and we'll go along with it. Uh, but if not all groups have that same dynamic, then it, it doesn't work uh, in the long run. Questions? Um, the House rules governing the formation of caucuses play into this at all? Because uh, my impression, which may be wrong, was pretty easy to form a caucus, but the rules about having a, having a staff is fairly <coughs> unusual. What are, what are the rules about whether you can raise money and actually have your own staff, and does that play into the influence of these caucuses? Yeah, so I'm not an expert on that, but I can speak from experience, because I, I worked on the Hill when the rules were changed by the Republican majority after 1994. Uh, before then, uh, it was easy to form groups and to have a budget and have staff. Um, and then, uh, based, then Republicans changed the rules, and so a lot of these groups either uh, disappeared or they folded into something outside of, uh, out of Congress, like a nonprofit sort of thing. So the DSG was probably their biggest target, and the DSG basically became part of Congressional Quarterly because uh, it was this big, you know, it was, had tons of money, it had staff, it had all these members. It was a, a sort of a source of power in its own right. I think what's interesting is that despite those changes, you still have caucuses. Now, I don't know how you navigate these rules. I, um, I suspect the staffing issue is unusual. You probably have to have a member hire the staffer and have them work for that member as opposed to a separate organization. Um, I don't know, I don't really know about budget rules or how that works. But I think it's telling that despite those reforms, members still want to form these things. So there's something that's fundamental about them that's important to the members, uh, as opposed to the rules of the chamber giving them an inducement to do it. I can answer a little bit of that. I was a borrowed staff in Congress for nine years. I was a special project scholar where I ran a study group with Senator Ruger and the Ruger House members. And I came in from the university, and so it was shared with everyone. And I don't know if you've done the comparison with the Democratic Study Group, but it had dozens of Republican members, meaning that Republicans were paying the Democrats for a really good research inside Congress, like rapid response information. What the Republican <coughs> Study Committee was able to do was wipe out everybody else's ability to have staff, but they kept about 12 people, and they maintained about 12 people. And to your point earlier, I don't think you can discount the fact that their level of institutional memory was far deeper and more consistent over decades at this point than anybody else that had organized for sharing information informally in Congress. There are a couple ways you can staff caucuses. The reason like we didn't create a caucus, um, I worked on foreign policy and national security for these this group of members, which was at some point, like hundreds of staff were coming to it. We just used empty committee rooms. And it was 50-50 <coughs> Democratic and Republican. And the tragedy of those rules changes in 1995 was that it just eliminated, before it became transactional to the point that you're punished for doing anything with the other party, it eliminated the common venues to do anything, to discuss, to create sort of a supply chain of coalition building into a policy, and that was just all wiped out and it was you know a decade and a half later before it became really punitive but 
um, you can create an advisory council on the outside that um, does the research and the staffing and convenes with the sort of letterhead that any staff person you ask uh, pretty much will say that all caucuses are now are updated mailing lists. Um, and so th they're a way for uh, somebody to say, yeah, I'm on that caucus, but they don't do anything substantive. The problem, it was really the privatization of the caucus space, because when you're the hunger caucus or the environmental caucus or some other kind of international global public interest, there's not a ton of money in um, organizing for you on the outside. What happened was you had a lot of the lobbyist organizations simply put in another wing and staff the caucus because yeah. those lists were still available. And so there's only a couple ways that you can still staff a caucus so it's substantive and actually produces. Um, and those are very often staffed with fellows. You see really, you don't, you don't see them called caucuses because they have to be really, excuse me, registered with the institution. And there are rules and they involve members. But the far more interesting stuff happens in the working groups and study groups. And in like two this is a working group. And Brett. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm obsessed with this, <laughs> as you can tell. Uh, because it's uh, the ability for people who are colleagues to simply come together and meet on issues of common interest and take the very most basic risks of talking to each other have really been eliminated. That's an important point. I just want to dwell on this for a second because I think it speaks to intra party caucuses because it's not just about bipartisanship. I mean, Basically, within a party, if there are those that disagree with you and you are in a position of power in that party, you are not going to be predisposed, the history of mankind suggests, to give them a venue to make it easier for them to air their views. And so that competition is key. And I think this, this is an interesting argument that's been out in the media and the political science journals and others about our electoral system in terms of winner-take-all um, plurality kind of voting districts, single-member districts versus a more proportional system. And I think one way of thinking about that and thinking about the benefits and the cost associated with the way that we do business here is in this context of our large umbrella parties. But key to our large umbrella parties is their ability to incorporate and respond to new developments and changes and challenges that come from outside, right? And so I think the inter-party caucus is, is at the center of that, or at least plays an extraordinarily important part in that process, if in fact it does play out in that way. I don't know if you have any. No, I'm, I'm glad. I'm I like glad. to stay up here in the theory. You know, when, you, when I was in your class, you would maybe do empirical stuff. I just stay up here and just say platitudes. <laughs> but no, it's an important note. Can you repeat the question or summarize the question? The, you mean the last, the, the last question or comments? So, so this is about... Uh, the uh, importance of resources to caucuses and uh, whether having more resources makes them more influential. So we were talking about how the, the Freedom Caucus doesn't have a lot of resources, um, but that's part of these rules changes that were brought about after the 1994 election, the Republicans took over the House. Um, but as was pointed out, this affected lots of groups, not just the, uh, the Freedom Caucus. And so members who want to try to do something together on an issue have to either f usually form working groups or other kinds of informal groups to try to make up for that. I did want to um, just reiterate that, that effect on the DSG because that reminded me now of how um, the story on the Hill was Republicans preferred the DSG because they actually had the best information about Bill. I still have tucked somewhere some old DSG reports from like, you know, 1993 or something. Scott you know. Lilly has all of them. <laughs> Who does? Sorry? Scott Lilly has all of them. Oh, I'll bet he does. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, no, but just, and just one thing. So, um, so we want to be sure, right, that when we're talking about caucuses, the distinction I'm trying to make is between caucuses in general and then intraparty organizations. So intraparty organizations are this particular subset. Um, but as Susan Webb Hammond points out, you know, so many different caucuses. So you could have, uh, you could, you could say, perhaps say, well, I don't like interparty organizations, they're too disruptive, da, da. but you still want a hunger caucus or a, a, you know, a what have you caucus, right? Iron workers caucus, something, because this is an opportunity for members to share information and work together across party lines. I was just going to say on the resources, House Admin, either in the late 114 or early 115, did make it slightly easier for the bigger caucuses to effectively staff. Um, under the old rules, like the Hunger Caucus would just have a staffer in the chairman's office to cover that issue and 
as part of his job responsibilities and his pay because you couldn't separately pay. But some of the bigger caucus, what they've done is they've formed effectively dedicated staff by having shared staff who are shared with like a ton of offices but getting paid by 15 different offices in the house. And they changed the rules, again, either late 114 or 115 CHA uh, passed a resolution allowing uh, any caucus, they call them ECMOs instead of CMOs, any ECMO, a large caucus with over 20 or 25 members who wanted to donate money, could donate a portion of their MRA, and then that staffer would be listed as the staff of the caucus now. Okay. Uh, the money would be coming from the MRAs from the members, but they could just be a one dedicated staffer to the caucus. It's no extra money. It's no money from the outside, but it just made it organizationally easier to actually lodge someone in a you know, permanent position as part of that caucus. And that, I assume, was to mollify groups like Freedom Caucus or uh, RC or CBC who want to be able to do this without a problem, um, <laughs> without you know, reopening the pre-95 can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, well, they were already doing it. Just, they were just sharing, you know, $1,000 among 50 members to pay a dedicated staff. It was a nightmare administrative thing. Any other questions? Comments? One of the issues that you mentioned that the HFC has been active on is immigration. And people have mentioned some of the outside groups that have been loosely affiliated with uh, the House of Caucus, like Club for Growth. Excuse me? Could you tell us? Oh, about sure. Um, <laughs> is loud enough? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> One of the issues you mentioned that the HFC has been active on is immigration, and of mm -hmm. course that's been very visible uh, this past week. Uh, some of the outside groups that have been loosely affiliated with the HFC, like the Club for Growth, either don't take a position on immigration or they're actually on the more pro-immigration side. Is this an area where there's conflict, and why does HFC feel the need to take uh, a, a position on this particular issue when you wouldn't think it would be the natural thing for a group called the House Freedom Caucus. So I, yeah, I haven't looked at that issue in the 115th, um, and so I think I, I can't necessarily answer that question. However, um, we have. I think one thing that could possibly explain it, if you're right that there's outside interest groups that don't agree with the Freedom Caucus on this issue, is that Freedom Caucus members are very much aware of their districts and how President Trump either is or they believe is very popular in those districts. And so if the president says, I want to build a wall, right, and I want it now, to say, well, no, you know, we're the Freedom Caucus, we believe in open borders, that's probably not going to play in their districts. So they're, they're just as electorally aware as any other member of Congress um, and, and presumably want to get reelected. So that could be one of the factors that's going into their calculation. Last question. You touched on this a little earlier with the Export-Import Bank. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could say more about how effective the House Freedom Caucus was in shaping that debate and how that might be playing out down the road uh, with that institution. <clears throat> uh, well, yeah, so the, that is an interesting case because there were a lot of different uh, moving parts. Uh, Part of it is that the Freedom Caucus was not alone, as I mentioned, in opposing the, the renewal of the charter for the Export-Import Bank. Um, and they had well-placed people both in party leadership who openly opposed it and a well-placed committee chair who opposed it. Um, so there was a way in which they weren't trying, th they didn't have to do as much to get the outcome that they wanted. The other th key thing about that is that um, by doing nothing, they got the outcome that they wanted. It's much easier to get the outcome you want if you don't have to do anything. Um, so whereas a lot of these cases involve moving the status quo point, enacting new legislation, and getting it the way you want, well, that's difficult. But um, literally, just just not just let the bill die in committee, and then and then you're done. So uh, I think what's remarkable about, about that story is the way in which supporters of the Export Import Bank were, were willing to use the discharge petition and kind of do this this move uh, around the Freedom Caucus. Uh, and and opponents of, of the bank, and so um, uh, so you know, kind of ironically, they're like, well, if we don't do anything, we'll get what we want. Oh, you know, someone was active and ended up, you know, <laughs> renewing this darn bank. Going forward, I don't I don't know. I can't speak to it. I think it would have been interesting if uh, Scott Garrett, right? I believe is the former Freedom Caucus member who was nominated. Right. 
to, to head the <laughs> Export Import Bank, um, right? If he had actually gotten that position, then you would see a, a, this more of a dynamic where the Freedom Caucus might be able to change outcomes through administrative uh, procedures or process. That ended up not happening. So going forward, I don't know what will happen with the Export Import Bank, but I think it is an example of how the Freedom Caucus, in that case, everything was moving in the right direction for them. Um, but they, you know, then they get, they, there was a majority in the House that was found a way to go around them. Which illustrates that doing nothing isn't always the easiest thing. <laughs> um, well, join me in thanking uh, Matt for this wonderful paper, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and have a great day.